We're excited about having a wonderful service tonight. Would you stand together with us, please? We're going to sing to crown him Lord. Several songs here to worship. Let's sing together. All hail the power of Jesus name.
Jesus Christ lives. And we welcome you to this wonderful service as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you're here, many members and many guests for the very first time. Thank you for making this a part of your resurrection weekend. As we get started tonight, just a couple of things we want you to know about. First of all, we want to remind everybody that we have a great nursery provided. And if you step out in the lobby, if you have a baby, the ushers will help you as uh, we want everyone to be able to hear the message tonight as it is given. Secondly, I want to remind you that everyone that you're going to hear sing or uh, everyone that will be a part of the uh, video presentation tonight are members of Lancaster Baptist. This is something they're doing as an offering unto the Lord, a part of their worship. And I know that it's their heart and prayer that the message will sink deeply into each and every one of our hearts tonight. I do want to remind you after the service that uh, we want to encourage every guest to stop by one of the guest tables. We have a gift for you there. It's a devotional book, and uh, we'd like to hear a little bit about how you heard about Lancaster Baptist Church. So please stop by and say howdy at one of those tables. I'll be out at the West Wing Lobby. I hope you'll say hi. If you have kids with you, uh, we have our football field full of little gifts for the children, and we hope they'll stop by there for a few minutes and, and enjoy some fun there as well. Right now, we want to have prayer and ask the Lord to bless this service, and so would you join me in prayer tonight? Father, we thank you for the truth that we celebrate, the truth of the resurrection, and we pray that our hearts would grow deeper in love with you because of our time spent here tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would bring us together in spirit and closer to you, and for those in this room who do not know that heaven is their eternal home. May tonight they see the significance of the empty tomb like never before. And we pray and ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uncle Nahum? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, Mary Magdalene, come on in. Oh, what's the matter, my child? It is Jesus of Nazareth. They have killed him. His followers have fled. Roman soldiers are everywhere. I don't know what is going to happen. I feared this would happen when you started following him. Oh, oh, Mary, I'm sorry for you. But he stirred up a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. And I worried for you. Worried for me, Uncle Nahum? Do you remember what it was like before I met him? Do you remember what I was like before I met him? Oh, yes, indeed. We all remember that, Mary. You were in a very difficult place then. A difficult place? I was completely out of control, out of my mind, guilty and hopeless, oppressed and controlled by demons and dark spirits. So many in our town, so many in our own family forsook and neglected me. People went out of their way to avoid being near me, but not him. For years, people saw my condition and averted their eyes and walked away. But Jesus, he came to me when I was desperate, hopeless, lost and alone. He came to me. He did not respond to my condition with repugnance. He responded with compassion. He not only healed me, he saw me. He accepted me, and he met my needs. I have known many people in my life, uncle. Some who tried to help me, and many who did not. But there is only one who accepted and healed me. Only one who met my desperate need. Only one. Jesus! There's only one 
name, only one name. The angels rejoice and bring forth the praise of only one name, only one name. He rules with compassion, with power and grace. There's only one name, only one name. Tonight, we see the story of a woman in the Bible named Mary Magdalene. And it's very interesting when you read about Mary Magdalene, for the Bible tells us in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 9, 
Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. How many of you would have liked to have been the first one to see the resurrected Christ? He went to her first. And tonight, we are going to see that Mary Magdalene's story is a reminder to all of us of the grace of God. Though unworthy of such attention, though unworthy of such condescension and love, Mary Magdalene was the first to see the resurrected Christ. Now, in today's culture, sometimes we need to be reminded of the true meaning of certain things, and Easter is one of those certain things, because more and more America is becoming a post-biblical culture, and sometimes you talk to young people especially, and they've never heard of basic people in the Bible like Adam and Eve or even maybe Noah or Joseph, and especially not Mary Magdalene. I heard about a Sunday school teacher that asked her class to write one sentence on, what does Easter mean to you? And one of the pupils wrote, Easter means egg salad sandwiches for the next two weeks. And that's about all that she really got out of what Easter was. But Easter is the story of God's power and grace shown to all men. The first to hear of the birth of Jesus Christ, God's Son, were the shepherds, common working men. The first to hear of the resurrection of the Son of God, Mary Magdalene, a woman that we might call a woman of the street, possessed of devils, a woman whose life was a complete wreck without the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that she had seven devils that existed in her body, seven demons. The word Magdalene implies to us that she was from the village of Magdala, dear, near to the Sea of Galilee. And we learn in the New Testament that as she followed Jesus, this woman not only converted to be a follower of Christ, but she served him righteously. She served him faithfully. And yet that's not how her story really began. I want you to learn with me tonight about Mary's trouble, because she had a lot of trouble. And Many of us have experienced similar trouble in our lives as well. The Bible tells us in Luke 6 uh, and rather Luke 8 in verse 2 about how she was accepted by Jesus Christ. It says there, and a certain woman which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. This woman was held captive by evil spirits. And the evil spirits were common then and they are common today as well. The Bible tells us about some of the evil spirits in Luke's gospel, chapter 4 and verse 33. We're told of a man who came to the synagogue possessed of such spirits. The Bible says there, and in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who who thou art, the Holy One of God. By the way, sometimes the devils know more about God than people do. And the devils say through this woman, I know, or through this man, I know who thou art. Thou art the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. Now, as with this man in Luke chapter 4, Mary Magdalene, similar, had spirits within her that controlled her. They, They no doubt did things even against her will by the power of Satan within her. And I would say to you this evening that spiritual oppression and emotional anxiety have been on the rise in the last few years. Satan has had his way during this pandemic time with people who have become addicted to social media, people who have become depressed, people who have gone to the dark side in some cases, turning themselves away from God, away from the Word of God. Depression and anxiety have risen by at least 25% since COVID. Social isolation brought on by the pandemic enhanced these negative emotions Inability to receive support from loved ones was certainly something that people experienced the last few years, and that led to loneliness, and and some had the fear of infection, and amongst health workers, there was exhaustion, and and, uh, major difficulties emotionally often felt. Young people, we're told, uh, were hit the worst by this type of depression. 
The mental health of young people uh, was something that affected them disproportionately uh, with a various different rise as seen in self-harming behaviors. In fact, anxiety gripped the hearts of many people these last few years. Anxiety is a meteor shower of what ifs. What if this? What if that? And people filled with fear begin to turn many times to all the wrong places for their help. We see this woman, a woman filled with evil spirits, a woman filled with difficulty and anxiety in her life. Someone said the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. No one has to remain captive of the evil spirits or of anxiety or depression. If they would but turn to Jesus Christ, he would set them free. And this is what Mary Magdalene is going to show us tonight, that Jesus can make all the difference. She was a woman captive of evil spirits. She was a woman captive to her own sin. The Bible tells us in Luke 7, 37, and behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at meeting the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. We see this woman, Mary Magdalene, most likely in Luke 7, following Jesus. She had heard him speaking. She perhaps had been converted before she went into this Pharisee's house. And she brings an alabaster box of ointment, wanting to wash the feet of Jesus. And yet, the Bible tells us that she was known in the city as a sinner. And can I just pause here to say, It's not just Mary Magdalene that is a sinner, but the Bible tells us that the root of all of our problems is that we are all sinners. People like to divide the human race up into little categories culturally and ethnicity-wise, but that's not how God sees us. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We are not sinners because we do certain wrong things. We are sinners because we are born with a sinful nature, a nature that we've inherited from our parents, grandparents, all the way going back to the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. We are all born with this sinful nature. And sometimes we see it very early in life. We see it in the nursery at times. We see it in preschool and kindergarten. People don't have to be taught how to sin. It's just something that kind of comes natural to them. I heard of one boy that asked another, he said, how did you get that bruise on your arm? And he said, well, I ate some chocolate Easter eggs. He said, well, how do you, how do you eat chocolate Easter eggs and get a bruise like that? He said, they were my brother's chocolate Easter eggs. <laughs> it just seems like we learn how to sin at a pretty young age. And sin, unfortunately, separates us from God. Our sin nature separates us from God. Mary Magdalene, possibly a prostitute, was known as a sinner. That was the name the Bible gave to her. And someone would say, well, that's pretty tough to describe someone that way. But when you read a little farther, you find the Bible describes us all that way. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one in this room that could come even close to the righteous standard of an almighty God. Sin separates us from God. He is high and holy, and this human race is fallen and depraved and in need of a Savior. Sin separates us from God, and sadly, sin will take us farther than we want to go. Sin will take people farther and farther into desperation, anxiety, depression, drugs, alcohol, sinful habits of all kinds. In fact, the Bible goes so far as to say the wages of sin is death. It is a spiritual alienation from God. And we know and we have seen the results of sin. Sin kills the conscience. Sin kills marriages. Sin hurts families. Sin is a terrible thing. It's a universal problem. It's something that must be dealt with. It's something that can only be dealt with by the work of one who would pay for our sin on a cross and raise up again three days later. I guess you could say that Mary's trouble is all of our trouble because all of us need a Savior Let's learn a little more about what Jesus did. A man like this Jesus, with all those lofty ideas that he had, uh, 
he made enemies, he made many enemies. He upset a lot of powerful people. I feared this would end very badly. It was awful. You should have seen it. Caiaphas and the other Pharisees had him arrested. They hired people off the street to witness against him. Well, Caiaphas had no authority to put anyone to death. They took him before Pilate. And even though he knew Jesus was innocent, the priests riled the crowd to cry for his crucifixion. And Pilate relented and sentenced him to death on a cross. Well, what about all of his followers? Didn't they? They, they all fled. They were scared. What did you do, Mary? Did you run? No, also? I couldn't. I had to stay. I had to be there. Well, now tell me this. This, this man with all these supernatural powers that you told me he had, this miracle worker, why didn't he just free himself from all of that? I don't know, Uncle. I don't know. He did not even resist. In his eyes, there was not only pain, but there was compassion and forgiveness. Forgiveness? As the soldiers nailed him there, I heard him say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was a man full of forgiveness. He forgave me. He never brought up my past. And even there through the pain, he was full of compassion and forgiveness. I cannot believe he is God. But for his forgiveness and for what he did for me, he is worthy of all the honor and power and praise I can bring. Yeah. 
Well, Mary had a troubled life indeed, but when she met the Lamb of God, there came a turning point in her life. A change took place when she turned to Jesus Christ alone to be her Savior. One day, Mary, like many others in Galilee, heard Jesus speaking some words that spoke very deeply to her. Matthew 11 and verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now you can imagine what those words would have meant to someone like Mary. To think of a burden that was light, to think of a yoke that was easy, to think of finding rest for your soul. No doubt she had longed for a lighter burden. No doubt she wanted these demons to go away. No doubt she had regretted the sinful life she had lived. And sin can be a very hard thing to carry. And now she hears Jesus speaking about a lighter burden, speaking about an easier life, a life without the load of sin. It may very well have been that Mary Magdalene received Jesus Christ upon hearing those words. It may be that she turned to him at that instant. We do not know the exact instant, but whenever it happened, we know that it happened by faith. We know that she made a decision of her own volition to turn to Jesus Christ. She came to trust Christ by faith. When she came into Simon's house, this man we spoke of a moment ago, her faith was noticed by Jesus Christ. She was a sinner, no doubt about that. But Jesus said of her in Luke 7 and verse 50, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. And can I say tonight that everyone who ever comes to Jesus and believes that his blood can cover sin and believes that his tomb was empty, everyone that ever comes and asks him to be their Savior comes by faith. And this is how Mary Magdalene came. She came to Christ by faith. And she came to Jesus because she knew that she needed forgiveness. Now, everybody knew that Mary Magdalene needed forgiveness. But again, all of us know tonight, if we're honest, that we also need the forgiveness of God. Luke 7, 47 says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Think of those words. Thy sins are forgiven. And you know, anxiety decreases as your understanding of God's forgiveness increases. No doubt hearing that her sins were forgiven brought a change into her heart, brought a relief into her spirit to realize what Jesus Christ had said. Now take a moment with me and think about these words, thy sins be forgiven, because we all understand that only God can forgive sin. Churches may say they can, but they cannot. Idols may purport to forgive sin, but idols cannot forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. When Thomas saw the resurrected Christ in John 20, 28, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus did not say, Thomas, don't refer to me as such. He received that commendation. He received that worship because Jesus Christ is God, and because he is God, he alone can forgive sin. And so only God can forgive sin. And forgiveness is available to anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ like Mary Magdalene did. The Bible says, for by grace are we saved. That's the grace of Jesus. For by grace are we saved through faith. It is our faith in Jesus Christ that brings salvation. Not our faith in a church, not our faith in baptismal waters or sprinkling or any other work that we can do. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, Mary Magdalene had nothing to offer Jesus. She couldn't work hard enough or long enough to somehow earn salvation. She simply believed that this was the Son of God. 
This was why Jesus came. In fact, this is what we learn about Jesus on the cross, Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus Christ has always offered forgiveness, whether it was Mary Magdalene, whether it was those that crucified him on the cross, or whether it is us today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he alone can forgive sin. And when we turn to Jesus Christ, not only are we forgiven, but we are reconciled to God. We are brought back back into a relationship that Adam and Eve once enjoyed, that the human race once knew, the innocence, the purity of it all that was known in the beginning is restored to someone who turns to Christ and has their sins forgiven. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross, took the pain of sin and destroyed it and offers forgiveness to all that will come to the cross and believe on him. There was a family on a picnic and after a little while a bumblebee flew by their table and the little boy was quickly aroused and frightened and the mother began to try to shoo the bee away from him and the insect kind of avoided them for a while but he kept coming back closer and closer. The little boy had allergies. They were afraid he might have some type of an anaphylactic shock if he was stung by this bee. And so hysteria quickly set into the family picnic. And after a while, the father jumped up and he, he said, son, don't worry, don't worry. And he said, you don't have to be afraid. And he was kind of a quick athletic type guy. And after a moment, he grabbed that bee and he held that bee into his hand. And you could see a grimace on his face. In fact, he opened up his palm and he showed his hand to his son. He said, you don't have to be afraid. He said, look at here. Look at the stinger. He said, it's okay. It's okay now. All he can do is fly around and buzz. He's not going to be able to sting you anymore. He, he's not going to be able to hurt you. The father said, I took the sting away. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took the sting of sin and death away. And all Satan can do in the life of a believer is buzz around, but he can never sting you, he can never take you, he can never destroy you because Jesus Christ defeated him on the cross of Calvary. And Jesus offers forgiveness, and Jesus offers reconciliation, and no doubt it was this love of Jesus Christ, this forgiveness from Jesus Christ that caused Mary Magdalene to follow him all the way to the cross. John 19 and 25 says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And there she saw this perfect son of God, this one who had lifted her from the miry depths of sin, this one that had offered her hope. And she saw him suspended there between heaven and earth. And she saw the crown of thorns upon his head. And she saw the nails in his hands and in his feet. And she saw the blood as it came pouring down. She followed him there because she loved him. And I pray that we'll follow him tonight, wherever he would lead us, because we love him as well. Oh, I'm truly sorry for you. What, what will you do now? I'm not really sure. Hmm. After Sabbath, I'm going to his tomb with his mother and some other women to take spices and anoint his body for proper burial. It seems that is all I can do. I know why you're here. You seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Go quickly and 
tell his disciples he will meet them in Galilee. Don't be afraid, Mary. Tell my followers I am alive and I will meet them in Galilee. Uncle Nam, I can't explain it. I don't know how, but I have seen him. Who? Who have you seen? I saw Jesus. I met him. I talked to him. He is alive and he is headed to Galilee. No, Mary. I know you want this to be true, but you must face reality. Jesus is dead. I'm telling you, Uncle. I met him. He talked to me. There was an angel. I always worried about you getting so caught up with this movement. And what, now? Now you're seeing things? Now you're hearing things? It is not like that. There were others with me. We all saw him. You must calm yourself. What will people say? What will they think of you? You cannot go back to the place where you were completely out of your mind, Mary. Come, Uncle Nahum. Come with me. Come to Galilee. See for yourself. Well, can this be? It is not possible. See that Jesus is who he said he was. See that he really does bring healing. That there is forgiveness and love and acceptance. Come and see that there is hope. A hope so strong that it cannot be defeated. Even by death.
all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. So go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all things that I've taught you. And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Oh, Mary, you were so right. I don't understand it, but I believe it. This is the greatest miracle in the world. Because Mary turned to Christ, Mary became triumphant in Christ, and she was able to experience firsthand the victory of the resurrection. The Bible tells us that at first, her journey was a very sorrowful journey. She was there at the time of his crucifixion, at the time of his burial. Matthew chapter 27 tells us, and when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene. Imagine how she must have felt those first few hours after the crucifixion going to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, being a part of the process of his burial. One can only imagine the increased trouble, perhaps the doubt, the increasing anxiety coming back into her soul, the sorrow that she experienced. But then we read about the surprise that she experienced there in that place. The Bible says in John 20 and verse 11, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept and stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. What an amazing triumph indeed to come face to face with the resurrected Christ. Now, his resurrection was the greatest miracle ever known on this planet and the greatest miracle of history, and it was great in many senses. It was great because it proved that he truly was God in the flesh, that he truly was the Son of God. He had prophesied that he would die, that he would raise up again. He now proved his deity with the fulfillment of that prophecy. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not pl take place, Henry Morris said, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. And what a tremendous truth it is for us to celebrate tonight. During the decade following Russia's Bolshevik Revolution around 1917, Joseph Stalin began to send various emissaries throughout the land to promote Marxism. And the leaders that he sent were empowered to speak in public places and to speak against God, to speak against the church, and to promote Marxism and communism. One day a large crowd gathered during this time, and one of the speakers began to extol the virtues of communism. Satisfied that he had adequately made his case, the political speaker sat down. And as the place stilled, there was a pastor standing in the back of the gathering hall, and he spoke out 
And he spoke loudly enough that all could hear him. He said, I have one thing to say. Christ is risen from the dead. Though aware of the retaliation that could certainly follow, the crowd immediately responded by saying, Christ is risen indeed. Would you say that with me tonight? Christ is risen indeed. You see, the pyramids of Egypt are famous because they contain the mummified bodies of ancient Egyptian kings. Westminster Abbey in London is famous because it holds the bodies of English nobles and notables. Mohammed's tomb in Medin, as Saudi Arabia, is noted for the stone coffin and for the bones that it contains. The Taj Mahal in India is built as a memorial to the wife of one of India's shahs, and Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is revered, for it is an honored resting place for those who sacrificed for our great nation. But the garden tomb of Jesus is famous, not for what is inside, but because it is empty tonight, and we celebrate the truth of the deity of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the amen to all of the promises of God. The resurrection proves the deity of Jesus Christ, and his resurrection provides hope for all of us to one day be resurrected into the presence of God. The Bible says in John 11 and 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. During the first year of this pandemic, my mother was in a hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. She had been suffering for, with Alzheimer's for several years. Because of the pandemic, we were not able to go in and visit her. One of the tragedies of the past few years is that many people were alone and suffering. And my mother was one of those. My mother was a typical Irish Catholic girl growing up in Chicago. She went to church once in a while. She got a little more involved when she turned 16. In fact, she thought she might want to become a nun at one time. One day, someone invited her to a youth rally where she heard for the first time that a church could not forgive sin. She heard that salvation was not through the church or the sacraments, but that someone, in order to truly triumph, would have to turn to Christ alone to be their Savior. And my mom, at age 16, at the Ashburn Baptist Church in Chicago, prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Savior. She began to follow the Lord and made her way off to Bible college, where she met my dad, and the rest became history. And there she was in that hospital. I was able to see her a few days before she went home to be with the Lord. She did not know who we were. She could sense our presence, but she was not aware specifically of who we were. Finally, the moment came when she sighed her final breath. And I tell you today, as sure as I stand here, the Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I base that hope not upon the dogma of a church. I base that hope upon the empty tomb of Jesus Christ who became the first fruits of the resurrection so that all who are in Christ will also be with the Lord in heaven for all of eternity. Oh, what a wonderful hope we find in the empty tomb. John 6 and 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. What a wonderful hope. You see, all of us tonight have the same trouble that Mary had, the trouble of sin. All of us have the opportunity to turn to Christ with a repentant heart to acknowledge our sin and to seek his forgiveness and for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. God says, if you'll turn to me, you will not perish and no one can break our relationship. 
Friends, I'm so thankful tonight that Jesus, after his resurrection, showed himself alive by many infallible truths and by many infallible proofs. It was known that he was the resurrected Christ by over 1,500 eyewitnesses. One day, the t- time finally came for him to ascend back into heaven to be with his Father. The Bible says in Acts 1 and 9, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, not only does the resurrected Christ provide proof and the promise that we one day will be in heaven with the Lord, it also reminds us that Jesus Christ will come again to be with us for all of eternity. Pastor Adrian Rogers used to say when troubling times were abounding, he said, we hear about troubling times and we can smile and say to one another, it's getting gloriously dark out there. Darkness is but a sign that the day of the Lord's glory is getting closer. The day of Jesus' crucifixion could hardly have been a darker day, but it also was a reminder that the day of his resurrection was just around the corner. And you and I may see pandemics and we may hear of wars and rumors of war and all kinds of difficulty. It's getting gloriously dark, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus Christ is coming again. And if you know Jesus, all of the troubling times point to the fact that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go to prepare this place for you, I will come again, Jesus said, that where I am, there you may be also. Today, because Jesus is alive, we can bring our burden of sin to him. We can turn to him in faith. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power, uh, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And for those who believe on his name, the Bible declares that our name is placed into the book of life. No one can take your name out of that book. No one can take your soul away from the keeping of God. There's a lady who lives in Seattle. Her name is Ruth. She's a very accomplished musician and singer. She was invited to sing at a wedding not long ago, and she certainly did a wonderful job singing at the wedding. She also was invited to the reception at a very high skyscraper in Seattle, a very fancy restaurant. And after the wedding, she and her husband made their way to that reception and they stood in the line and they got to the front of the line and there was a a man standing there at the podium and he had a a book for the guests and so forth. And and as they arrived there, he said, your name, please. She gave her name, Ruth so-and-so. He began to look through the book. He said, I I don't have you here. I, I don't see that your name is in the book. She said, well, Something must be wrong. I sang at the wedding. I mean, I was a part of the wedding party. He said, I understand that, ma'am, but your name's not in the book. I'm not going to be able to let you in. And this dear lady, her and her husband, Ruth and her husband, they turned away and they began to walk toward the elevator and then down the elevator. And her husband looked at her and said, Ruth, what, what was that all about? What happened? She said, well... When the invitation arrived, I was busy, and I never bothered to send the RSVP. She said, besides, I was the singer. I, I thought I could just go to the reception without an RSVP. Now listen very carefully. There's only one way to know that your name is in the book of life, and that is to RSVP. <laughs> That is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to have a moment in your life when you turn to him exclusively with a heart well aware of your sin and well aware of the fact that only he can forgive your sin. And when you turn to him, he will save you. Because there will come a day for those who do not have a moment of salvation in this lifetime 
The Bible says they will stand before the Lord and they will say, Lord, in your name I cast out devils. I prophesied. I sang at the wedding. And the Lord will say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's very important, friends, that when you come face to face with the gospel, as we have tonight, that we see it as more than an historical event, but as a personal event, that Jesus Christ died for us. Have you made your RSVP? Has there been a moment in your life when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Before we conclude the service and hear another song, I believe it would be appropriate to just take this moment right now and really settle that issue that, like Mary, we have put our faith in Jesus Christ alone to be our Savior. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what you have done for us through Christ our Savior. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made, for the forgiveness that is offered. We thank you that you say that if we'll confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that you, Lord, as the Son of God, died for our sins and rose again, that we can be saved. Thank you for that invitation. Lord, would you help each person here tonight to be honest about what they've done with that? With our heads bowed for a moment and our eyes closed, before we're dismissed tonight, I want you just to take a moment, if you would, and consider where you really are spiritually. I'm not saying to try to figure out if you're good or bad or what kind of good works you've done. The real question is this, what have you done with Christ? Has there been a moment in your life when you turned to Him in faith, turning to Him as a sinner needing a Savior and said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life and save me. There's going to be folks that are not found in heaven. There's going to be folks spending an eternity apart from God who were Baptist and Mormon and Catholic and Presbyterian and you name it. It's not about your brand name or your religion. It's about have you personally turned to Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. He's ready and willing to forgive you now. And I wonder all across this auditorium, how many in this auditorium with heads bowed and eyes closed can say, Pastor Chapel? There's been a moment in my life when I turned to Christ alone and I, I told him, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I confess that to you and I ask you to forgive me and be my Savior and give me a home in heaven someday. How many of you have had that type of a moment where you were born spiritually by putting faith in Jesus Christ? I'm not asking when you were baptized or joined a church. I'm asking when you were saved. I'm asking when you put your faith in Jesus only. And if you can recall that moment, maybe you could just slip up your hand and say, I remember that. Thank you for your honesty. Now, friends that did not raise your hand, I want to thank you for your honesty. And I want to remind you that just as you would make a reservation for a flight to Miami or a dinner at a nice restaurant, how much more so is it that you would hear the invitation of Jesus Christ and that you would respond and that you would take a moment and you would just say, Lord Jesus, I do know that I'm a sinner and I confess that to you. And I want to turn to you now and ask you, Lord, to forgive my sin and to be my Savior. Now, if you did not raise your hand a moment ago, but you would say, Pastor Chapel, before we're dismissed, I want to receive Christ. I want to have a moment that I can remember where I prayed and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and life. I want to get it settled. I don't want to go another day. Some of you have heard this many, many times. When you first started hearing it, your hair was not gray or you had hair. Friend, you don't want to put this off. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Now is the day of salvation. If God's speaking to your heart, don't put it off. 
How many of you in this room would say, Pastor Chapel, I couldn't remember a time when I specifically prayed that prayer, but I would like to take care of this matter. I would like to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and know that heaven is my home someday. If God could save Mary Magdalene, I think God could save me, and I'd like that very much. And if you'd like to get that settled tonight, I'd like to pray for you. I wonder right now if you just lift your hand. Just hold it up. I will not embarrass you. Hold your hand. God bless you. Just say, I didn't raise my hand a minute ago, but I'll raise it now. Just lift it right up. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. I see your hands. God sees your hands and hearts. God bless you, sir. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being honest. Who else? I need to make sure of this. This is too important. I don't want to let it slip by. Is there anybody else? Here's what we're going to do. Those of you that raised your hands, I want to encourage you tonight to do something very important and yet very simple. And this is what it is. I want to help you right now to just pray right there in your seat. You've heard the gospel. And just pray and ask Jesus Christ by faith to come into your life and forgive your sins and be your Savior. Some of you did not raise your hand, but you can pray this with me. Some of you maybe are a little embarrassed. I don't want you to be. I just want to help you tonight. If you are not sure that Christ is your Savior and heaven is your home, this is what I want to encourage you to do right now. I want to encourage you to call unto the Lord and just say something like this to the Lord. You can say it out loud. You can say it privately in your heart. Just say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, just say it. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I'm turning to you now, Jesus. And I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to be my Savior and to give me a home in heaven. I believe you died and rose again for me. All right? One more time. I want to help you. Say, someone says, I want to say this. I want to get this settled. If you'll mean this in your heart, and you'll say this to the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I ask you, Lord, to forgive my sin, to be my personal Savior and to give me a home in heaven. I believe that you died and rose again just for me. Now, whether you raised your hand a moment ago or not, if you just said that prayer with me, right now, why don't you just slip your hand up? Let me see you are. Just slip your hand up. All of you up to, that's wonderful. Hold it up there. Wonderful, wonderful. That's tremendous. And we want to congratulate you tonight. Father, you know everyone's heart here. We thank you for these who prayed right now. That's such an important prayer, that life-changing prayer. Lord, we know that salvation is not in the prayer, it's in the faith and the decision of the heart. And we thank you for that conviction and that decision that you brought. Bless these tonight, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand together with me, please? And would you that have accepted Christ, would you congratulate those that just did accept Christ as their Savior tonight? We are so happy for you and so thrilled that you made that decision. And I want to just take a moment while you're standing, and I want to encourage you. If you prayed that prayer just a moment ago, we have a gift for you that we'd like to give to you. And we're just going to have the piano play here in just a moment. And as the piano plays, I'm going to ask some of our uh, counselors just to come here to the front. And we want to just take a moment to give you a copy of a Bible to make a record of the decision you made today, maybe to get some follow-up materials mailed to you. If you have other questions, we want to encourage you to come. After this song, we're going to have a brief video and another song from the choir, so don't go anywhere. But we want to take a moment right now. For those of you that said that prayer, that is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. The most important decision. And we want to rejoice with you. And so if you receive Christ as your Savior tonight, while the piano is playing right now, I want to encourage you, if you're with a friend, just step out and come and see one of these men or the ladies that are up here at the front, and they'll help you. Let's congratulate them as they come. Just come right now. If God spoke to your heart, just step out right here. Someone to help you. You don't need to be embarrassed. Just come and tell one of these men, I prayed the prayer. I'm glad I did. Whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter. Just step out. There'll be someone to help you with that wonderful and we're very happy for you and we want to give you a copy of God's word we want to congratulate you and if you have further questions let us know and if there's still one or two just slip out we'll bring you right back in here in just a second they're going to give you a gift and fill out a card with you and try to help you along the way any way 
that they can. We're rejoicing with you, and congratulations to each and every one of you. Let's just wait a moment for these that are still coming. This is new for some people, coming up in the big church and walking down the aisle, but we wanted to take a moment to congratulate each and every one of them. Thank you for coming. God bless you. You can be seated. Let's see a quick video, and then we'll hear the final song from the choir. When God's love and grace encounter your life, He will change you from the inside out. Next week, Pastor Chapel continues his sermon series, A Transformed Life. We will study how the grace of God transforms lives from the inside out. If you are a guest with us today, welcome. If you did not receive your gift bag on the way in, we invite you to stop by one of our guest tables in the lobby to pick up your free gift. Inside is a hardback devotional book from our pastor, as well as a voucher for a free lunch next Sunday at our campus restaurant, The Point. Just a few minutes after the conclusion of this service, you are invited to pick up your kids from childcare and bring them down to the athletic field to enjoy our family fun activity, Fun on the Field. Come down for games, a petting zoo, Easter egg hunt, and more. Every mom and every child deserve a community of prayer and support. Being a mom and raising kids in today's environment is challenging. That is why this Mother's Day, May 8th, we will take time in our 1030 a.m. service to recognize and honor moms. We will have a time of prayer asking God to give wisdom and direction as you raise your child. If you would like to learn more about Lancaster Baptist Church, visit our Welcome Center on the first floor of the Rebels Building. There you can view videos and exhibits about the history, purpose, and future of Lancaster Baptist Church. Thank you to everyone at Lancaster Baptist Church who has contributed to our missionaries in Eastern Europe who are ministering to refugees from Ukraine. Through missionaries there, we have been able to provide shelter, meals, and the gospel to people fleeing into Romania. We have also sent supplies into the country of Ukraine itself. Pray that God will continue to use these acts of kindness to bring the gospel to hurting people there. Sunday, May 1st, Lancaster Baptist Church will be hosting a special service to honor the first responders of the Antelope Valley. We love our police officers, firefighters, and medical staff, and want to take some time to appreciate all you do for our community. The service will be followed by a complimentary luncheon for any first responders in attendance. Join us as we thank these faithful servants in our community. Thanks for joining us this morning. Remember, next weekend we return to our normal service schedule each Sunday at 8.30 or 10.30. As always, you can find out details about everything going on at Lancaster Baptist on our mobile app or on our website, lancasterbaptist.org. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Enjoy the rest of the service.
Not all prisoners of war had come home. These were battlefields of my own making. You see, I didn't know that the war. together and thank the choir and orchestra once again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much to our director, Brother Williams, Brother Hopkins. All of you did a great job tonight, and I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Jesus is Lord. Amen? And what a great truth that is. Don't forget to stop by the guest tables. Don't forget that what you just saw will happen tomorrow at 9 and 11. Bring a friend. Let them rejoice in what God has done for them through Jesus Christ. Say hi to us out at the tables. I'll be out at the West Wing. The children can go out to the fields. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful Resurrection Weekend. Yeah.